Praise the Lord. I was like just talking all of a sudden. I was like, why are they looking at me? Hey, we're going to talk about the Lord today. We're going to be talking. What, what series are we in? David. All right. Why don't you guys go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of First Samuel. First Samuel. We're going to be looking at uh, chapter 18 at the beginning. That's where we're going to kind of launch out from. How many of you guys were here last week and you enjoyed last week's message? Amen. Amen. Just a couple. That's what I kind of expected. Whenever you talk about authority and submission to authority, it's always uh, um, a little iffy. You don't know what you're going to get back. But uh, praise the Lord. Uh, I believe it was, it, was a, it was a good message. And uh, when, it, when I get home and Emily is usually a part of it, she's like, that was really good. You said a lot of things that weren't in your notes. And it's like, <laughs> that's when you know it's good. When the, when, I mean, you, I mean, there's like, you know, you have good notes for prayer that you've been praying over throughout the week and stuff like that. But when there's like good things, all of a sudden it's like, praise the Lord. And so that's what took place last week. And I, I that's what I pray for every week. I, I mean, I come prepared. I believe that's what Holy Spirit wants us to be prepared for all things. But when we come prepared, he usually does over and beyond um, the preparations that take place. And so, uh, we just uh, believe for that, that I would just be like that young boy with a couple loaves and some fish, come prepared to have lunch, and he would do something extraordinary, and it's all because of him. It's nothing, nothing for me, that's for sure, so praise the Lord. So First Samuel chapter 18, 1 through 5, we're going to be talking about David and Jonathan, David and Jonathan, and kind of entitled just True Friends, that's just the simple title of True Friends. So let's read the first five verses. Let me get a drink real quick. Verse 1 says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Verse five says, so David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sights of all the people and also in the sights of Saul's servant. Let me pray one more time. Lord, we thank you again for all that has taken place. Thank you just for the extended time of worship to be able to pinpoint some, some, um, some issues in some of our lives and probably many of our lives, God, that we just feel like we're deficient and we are undeserving of your goodness, Lord. But I just continue to pray and believe and we just break that off in Jesus' name. Any attitude, any mindset, any spiritual tie that we may have that is holding us back from receiving all your goodness, God. So we thank you and praise you once again for freedom, for your blessing, for your goodness, Lord in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In the story of Jonathan, there's, there's a real complexity to their relationship. There is something that, that can either be, for many, either spellbounding or can actually kind of make you feel a little uneasy. And there are some groups of people that like to use this relationship to be able to... Um, how can I say it, kind of, huh? Promote and, and maybe even a stronger word, pervert their own thoughts, their own ideologies because of the things that are said and are expressed and done through these two individuals' lives. These two men, these two grown men, um, when you read the story and you be able to, to dive into their relationship, a lot of people like to use it to be able to say that God approves of a homosexuality. Are we all right this morning? We doing all right? It's something that we need to be aware of, something that can cause embarrassment, that, it's, that it can be tough um, to, to really see pastors or preachers or whatever or, or Bible studies and really try to, to dive in and exegete the relationship between these young men, be, these, these men, because of the deep love they have for one another. In the day and age, in many of the cultures that we have grown up in, men are to be strong. 
You don't cry, don't show weaknesses, don't be too touchy-feely. That is the way that we have been grown, have been taught to be able to be raised in that situation, in that society. And a lot of the things that are done and the things that are said in this relationship go against all that many of us have been taught growing up as a young kid. They go beyond the, the societal norms that we face and the cultural um, definitions of friendship. There is one thing that is said in that uh, David says about Jonathan that takes place. I don't know if I'm a little loose or something. That takes place after Jonathan dies. And that is, he says this. He says, his love for me was as wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How do you try and explain that? Tell me, because I would like to know. When someone says that about another man, we kind of be like, whoa, okay. Just like yesterday, we were able to, to go and be a part of, of Charity's surprise birthday party. And uh, I was waiting, my parents texted me and they're like, you know what, my, uh, your mom, she's, her back isn't feeling very good. And so just uh, tell them we're not gonna be able to be there. We'll see them Sunday, but just send your love. And I'm like, you know what my parents said to send your love, so there it is. That's over there, just, you know, that's good. Stay over there, here's, here's, Here's my parents' love. That's good enough for you to know that they send uh, their love. But anyways, that's kind of the way we were raised and just the different things that are going on. But the reality we need to know and the revelation we need to have about the deepness, the depth of their love for one another is that it wasn't fleshly. We live in a very flesh-driven society where everything is on the outside. Everything is to indulge the flesh. That we look more on the facade on the, and the external. And that is what is driving culture today and age. And so that is the way that many people, when they read the Bible, is that they're reading it with eyes of flesh and a flesh mentality. Outward, still carnal. If you look up that word in the Greek, it means a meathead. That they're still looking at scripture, trying to prove their point, trying to meet their fleshly desires. But something that needs to be understood and a revelation from the Holy Spirit is it that, that it says that their souls were knit to one another. That there was a connection and a commitment that took place that went beyond the external and went internal. That it was a, a connection that was spiritual. And that is what needs to be understood about this relationship is that it was a spiritual connection that took place in their lives. It was a spiritual connection that knit the soul of David to the soul of Jonathan. And you begin to, as we're going to go through, we're going to begin to see the commitment and the love that they had for one another. And it even went beyond Jonathan's life span. David showed great commitment. He showed great love, even beyond the lifespan of Jonathan. After Jonathan died, that there was still something that took place after he had died that showed his commitment and his covenant. Mom, would you like to take Noah across the street to children? They must have forgot her. How can they forget someone or about her? Talk about the middle child syndrome, right? Man. Anyways, that's not over her. We're not speaking that. I'm not speaking that, right, Mom? Amen. Speak faith over her. She is a tough woman. She is a tough woman. She's a worker. She's strong for the Lord. She doesn't give up. I'm going off. I just have to dote on my child. I love all my kids, right? They're all different personalities. Micah's my firstborn. We had her for a while. Luke is my lastborn. But Noah is driven. Like there are some things, like we'll play, be playing basketball outside, and I have no idea what this has to do, but I just, I just felt like I needed to dote on her. She's even not here. But she's, she's getting into sports. She loves basketball. And it'll be hot outside. Like Micah will shoot, and then she'll be like, oh, it's too hot. I'm going inside. Micah's like, or Noah's like, I'm shooting. She'll be dripping. I'm shooting. I got to make five more baskets. I got to make, I mean, she is driven. I mean, and I'm not even telling her. I'm like, come on, let's go. 
And then she'll come up out with a whistle. I need a coach, dad. Come on. I'm like, man, this girl. So we are trying to pour into her because that's my 401k. Hopefully she makes it to the WNBA. <laughs> oh, I'm just playing. No, she is great. She's wonderful. I'm excited for what God is going to do in all of our kids' lives, right? Our kids are wonderful. Our kids are amazing. They're a blessing from the Lord. Even when they're up in the middle of the night throwing up all over us, they're still a blessing. Because one day that's going to be us and, and, and on them. Anyways. <laughs> kind of the context of where this took place, what we're reading this, this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 18, is a stage of transition in the life of David. That there's a transition taking place from his life of where we first saw him, of a place of obscurity, a place of being overlooked, a, a place of being alienated by his father out in the fields, being a shepherd, to now going into the actual palace of the king. In our scripture we read this morning that it said that he was no longer allowed to return to his father. Last week we were able to see how he was submitted to authority. He was submitted to authority to his father and to King Saul. And even that he would go back and forth as he served for Saul. He was able to play the harp before him and be able to expel that, that tormenting spirit that was upon him. A couple even, even weeks earlier than that. But at times that he would go back and still serve and be submitted to his father. But what was taking place now? is that there was a transition from being the shepherd, from being overlooked, from even having partial harp gigs playing for the king to now becoming a great warrior and the king we all know him to be. It's a stage of transition. A stage of transition is, is a stage of change. And no one likes change. Change is always difficult. There's a vulnerability in a stage of transition and a stage of change because what is taking place is there's a change of who I was and it's a change of transitioning into who I'm supposed to be, but I'm stuck somewhere in the middle because I'm not there yet, but I'm not who I was. Amen. And so there's something going on that I don't want to stay in this transition for too long because the transition stage is not the, the stage that I am meant to be. That I have a calling or a purpose upon our lives that many of us right now are in a stage of transition. That you're no longer something from your past, but you're not fully who God has called you to be. But I'm trying to work there, but I'm not there yet. But what is a stage of transition is it's a place of vulnerability. It's kind of like if you've seen, I think it's usually most snakes that when they begin to develop and grow that they have to molt their skin. And you can, if you go around any places, probably the Columbia River at certain times, you'll be able to see rattlesnake skins and casings all over the place because they expel those casings so that they can grow new ones and get bigger. And I know there's some types of crabs, I think hermit crabs and stuff, where they get rid of one shell and they go looking for another shell. That there's a transition and a stage between leaving the old and moving into the new. Leaving the old place of comfort and protection and going into the newness that is before us. But one thing besides the stage of transition and stage of vulnerability we need to understand is that transition always leads to growth. So even though you feel like this transition, I'm vulnerable, something's going on, I don't feel right, growth is taking place. Even when you don't see it, growth is taking place. Development is going on. God is doing something in your life, even though you may not sense it, even though you don't feel it. God is developing you and increasing you. And that is what is taking place excuse me, in David's life, that there was a growth taking place in him, that he was no longer the man who he was, or the boy he was, but he's not the king that he's supposed to be yet, but he's in this transition stage. And something that I think is amazing is that God performs a miracle. God performs a miracle in the life of David in this stage of transition, in this state of vulnerability, in this place of growth. And that is, the miracle is, is that he provided a friend. And not just any friend, he provided a true friend. 
in Jonathan. That as he was moving forward into the call that God had for his life, that God brought Jonathan in to be an aid, to be a comfort, to be someone that would be able to push him forward into the final stages of his destiny. And I believe what we can see through this scripture should be applicable to our lives. Because what we see with David is that David's relationship, him and God, got him to a certain level in life. But if it wasn't for Jonathan in his life in this stage of vulnerability, he would have never made it to his destiny. And I believe God places friends, true friends, in our lives to push us, to prod us, to bring us to that place of our destiny. If you go into the very beginning of the book of Genesis, you'll find a truth that runs throughout all threads of humanity. When God looked upon Adam and he said, it is not good for man to be alone. That we were created for community. We were created for fellowship. We were created for friendship. If we're living in a state of isolation, if we are alone constantly, that is not of God. That is a work of the enemy. The enemy tries to divide. The enemy tries to to break up a unity. But it's God that works to bring unity out of division. Because what we read in Psalms is that God blesses unity. Any type of unity. That's the crazy thing. In Genesis, there's a story about people building a tower of Babel. And they come in from all over the world at that time. They came to build the tower and God meets with himself. And they're like, what are we going to do about these people? Because they're trying to glorify self. And if they continue on, they're going to do it for the most part. They're going to exceed. They're going to fulfill what they want to do. So what happens is that God caused uh, a babble. He caused... uh, a dispersion, but he changed their, all their language so that they couldn't communicate with one another. That's why the enemy tries to, to get in the communication lines of a man and a woman. We just don't know what to say. Man, that's hot mic, hot mic, man. But God blesses unity. He loves community. He loves fellowship and he loves friendship. And I believe personally that if Jonathan wasn't brought in in this stage of life, that David would have never become who he was called to be. Because of this vulnerability, because of this stage of transition, he needed someone else there beside him, encouraging him, prodding him forward to be the man of God that he was called to be. In this stage of transition, vulnerability, his role was changing, his identity was changing, and he was transitioning into something that he didn't know. He wasn't aware of because of where he grew up, because of where he was raised. He was raised in poverty, in a small town outside the city gates of Jerusalem, a couple miles away. He was a shepherd. But God was bringing out of him, a place out of the country, bring him into the city. He was going from the pasture and moving his identity that he was going to become was in the palace. And so God brought him into the palace and all of a sudden King Saul says, you're going to stay with me all the time. What was he doing? He was bringing Jonathan into David's life to show him what royalty looked like. Because Jonathan was a resident of the palace, amen? David was a guest. But as the years go by, David was going to learn what it's like to live in the palace. And he needed someone there that would be able to show him what it looked like. David and Jonathan are a true friend. They were true friends. And for us, we need to know that we need to have true friends around us. Not every friend is going to be a true friend. We live in the day and age of social media, right? You can go on Facebook and within two days, you're going to have 500 friends. But how many of those people are really friends that we've never seen or never known, 
but it makes us feel like we're friends. Why? So that we can feel like we have community, we have fellowship, and still stay isolated in our own homes. I remember living in some larger cities and going into a coffee shop of Starbucks or whatever the place and people, I mean, it goes on, we see it here in small town. People are on their phones, texting, thinking they're in community when they're still just isolated with a screen. That things don't take place of true friendship that's needed in our lives. But we need to make time to cultivate, to grow and develop our friendships with one another. And that is what we see, and that's what we're going to be able to get to this morning, to be able to see how they cultivated their friendship, how they grew it, what it looks like to have true friendships. But Jonathan was a true friend. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. There was a British paper that had a contest a while back. And the contest was, send in your best definition of a friend. Do you want to hear what the winning entry was? Okay. The winning entry said, a friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. In David's life and in this transitional stage, he was sent out into caves, into the wilderness. And it was Jonathan who was able to come in when the whole world had gone out in his life. When King Saul was going to attack him, trying to kill him, because of the fear that he had upon his life, Jonathan was that friend who came in. That was there for him in his darkest of moments. That when we are facing hard times, when we're what seems like in our darkest moments, yes, look to God, but also look around you because there's friends that God has placed there miraculously in your life that will be an encouragement, that will help you to get through. And I know for some of us that we have that mentality almost of like what Lori was talking about this morning. Even when it comes to friends that that we don't deserve it. That when something bad happens, we just want to be isolated and be by ourselves. But that is not what God wants because he wants health and he wants healing in our lives. And that comes through healthy relationships. Amen. So we see that this is a stage from David going from obscurity to fame and notoriety. And I had some stuff in my notes of what exactly what Lori was sharing this morning. So I know that that was a word from the Lord this morning. Because I have in my notes, I just kind of went back over the last couple of of lessons and messages I shared. Because some people, even though they know God is good and they may think that he has goodness in store for you, you still don't think he has goodness in store for you. That it's not really for you. Because of just the isolation that has taken place in your lives. Because of the hurt that has taken place in your lives. And one of the reasons I believe that is because you've been comfortable with that stage of transition and isolation. That isolation has become your friend instead of the people that God has placed in your life. And that is why you're stuck in the cycles that you may be. Because God has put friends, and I I believe, hope that, that here in our church, that there are true friends among us and can be developed and grow. No, we're not all going to be those true friends, like Jonathan and David, but God can place one or two in your life. Amen? So what I want us to be able to see is these four points, these four areas that we get to see in David and Jonathan's lifespan that develops and cultivates a true friend or a great friend. My first point is great friendships require great commitment. Great friendships require great commitment. First Samuel 18, one through four, I'm gonna read it again. It says, now when 
He had finished speaking to Saul. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house any more than Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took, took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. People that want to change this and promote their own ideas see him taking off his robe as something of almost what would happen on the night of a marriage. But what was really taking place is that Jonathan, there's a couple things I believe what was taking place. First thing that is, that is, that is predominantly the overriding idea of what was taking place. He took off his robe. He took off his sword, his bow, his belt, all his armor. Why did he do that? Because he knew that David was going to be the soon coming king. He was the king to be because of culture. But he saw David as being the soon to be king. So he placed his position and gave it as the first born son of a king. He gave his robe to David. In the prodigal son, you hear the story about when the son went out, the young son went out and lived this lifestyle uh, of reckless and abandoned, blew all his money, his inheritance. And when he came back, the father placed a robe upon him because he's saying, this is my son. So when Jonathan met David, there was a spiritual connection took place. He saw something spiritually in David, his future and his destiny. And he's like, I want to get on board with that. And what did he do? He was the supposed next in line king and he took off his robe and he gave it to David because he knew that he was going to be king. He gave him all his stuff. Another thing that I think that is true about commitment and what was taking place is David was brought up in a place of poverty. Jonathan was brought up in a palace. And as he took off all that stuff, he was showing him, this is just who I am. I'm just like you. There was a place of honesty. That if we want to be able to have true commitment, true friendships taking place, that there needs to be a level of true honesty with one another. That it's not only being honest with ourselves, but are you honest with your friend, your spouse? If you want to elevate your marriage, you want to elevate any casual friendship, begin to be honest with people and see where that's going to take you. There may be some hurts, there may be some pains, but through it all, there will be a growth if you both continue to stick it out together. That is what we see, that there was an honesty taking place in the life as they were committed to one another. That they continue to show themselves honest and we see them as they begin to be tested through different things, that they stay committed to one another. When their commitment was tested, they made the decision to stick it out, no matter what was taking place. Even when Jonathan's dad was trying to kill this person that he was committed to, he stuck it out. Are we sticking out our commitments? No matter the hardships. Are we giving it all? Are we committed? Are we honest? David and Jonathan lived it out. They had great friendship that required a great commitment. Next, great friendship involves great risk. 1 Samuel 19, 1 through 4 says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you. And because his works have been very good towards you. Again, what was taking place is Saul was being tormented by an evil spirit, but he was also jealous of David. Why? Because people started to become aware that David was killing more of the enemy than King Saul was. 
We talked about it, I think, last week, how the women came in, that Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. That for the women in the house, if you're married, do not try and build up your husband by saying, oh, look at so-and-so, look at... I mean, what, what takes place is like, like HGTV. I am not a carpenter. I try, though. And then here's my wife looking at HGTV. Oh, see, it's just simple. Look what Chip does. He just does it. Yeah, you just take out the wall, right? Right, Tyler? You just take out the wall, put some French doors in. Who cares? Yeah. It's easy. He just does it right there. Look, he did it in an hour show with commercials. That's how easy it is. Anyways, but there was a jealousy that Saul had because of David. Because he saw him as a threat to the crown and to his throne. But one thing Saul didn't understand was something that we touched on last week. He didn't understand that David was submitted to authority. He didn't know the level of his submission to authority. And that's just a side point from last week. When you are submitted to authority, those that don't, aren't submitted to authority will not understand why you are. Because that's a societal norm. That is what culture believes, that you don't submit to authority, that you challenge authority and you try and go against the grain. That is what we've been trained. That's what we see on TV and we saw on 24, which apparently no one's watched. But go against authority. So when people aren't submitted to authority, they don't understand why you're submitted to authority. They don't understand the favor that's on your life by being submitted to authority. And they see it as a threat. And that is what took place in David's life. Saul began to see the favor that was upon David's life. And he was threatened by it. But he didn't understand that because of David submit, being submitted to authority, that that brought about a favor on his life. And that favor was actually supposed to come under the throne and be able to promote his place. Not only about David, but it actually goes up. Favor goes up. Blessing goes up. That's what happens through humility. As we bow down, as we are humble before God, humble before those in authority, we begin to have, be blessed and have favor and we continue to bless those around us. And that's what was David's blessing. And Saul was threatened by it. The one person that should have been threatened by it the most was Jonathan. And what did Jonathan do? He took a great risk and he was committed to him. He was committed to him. He began to be able to have communications with David. Even when Saul was out to kill him, he would go out into a cave. He would go out into the wilderness. Even when King Saul was on the other side of the mountain and David was on this side of the mountain, Jonathan would meet him and take a risk to meet with him, to encourage him. Great risk is taking great sacrifice. So what does that look like for you and I? It's like sacrificing for one another. Sacrificing for one another. John 15, 13, Jesus said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. When someone is going through a tough time, are we making a sacrifice so that we can help carry their burden? Whether it be an emotional risk, whether it be a financial risk, whether it be a, a time management risk, whatever it might be, are we becoming available? Are we taking a risk? Are we sacrificing for the betterment of our friendship with one another? Jonathan was committed and he took great risks, even if it cost him his own life. It cost him somewhat of a relationship with his dad too. But he understood God's call. He understood God's will. And that leads us to our third point. Great friendships include God. Great friendships include God. 1 Samuel 23, 15 through 18 says, One day near Oresh, David received the news that Saul was on the way to Ziph to search for him and kill him. Jonathan went to find David and encourage him to stay strong in his faith in God. And he said, don't be afraid, as he reassured him. My father will never, never find you. You are going to be king of Israel, and I will be next to you, as my father Saul is well aware. 
So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord. Then Jonathan returned home while David stayed at Horish. This was years later as the two came back together and renewed that covenant that began all the way back in chapter 18. They renewed their covenant. They renewed their commitment to one another. And also Jonathan encouraged him in the Lord. Encouraged him in faith in God. That to have a great friendship, their needs to include God. A desire for God and God's will was a big part of their relationship. And Jonathan was committed to David and he took great risks for David because he saw what God saw in David. He did all that because he saw what God saw in David. Jonathan, I believe, was very similar to David in that he was another man that had a heart after God. He wanted God's will to prevail, even if it cost him being the king. Talk about a sacrifice. Laying down his life, his, it, it, what should be his, laying that down to better his friend. Because it included God. He wanted God's will to be done, not his own, not his father. He wanted God's will. And that's what he was doing. He came encouraging David, encouraging him in the Lord, encouraging him in his call. Are we taking the time to not only know people around us, know and develop friendships, but taking the time to look at them and see the call of God upon their lives and speak it out and encourage them into that? Most of us are more worried about our own call. Who should I be? What should I do? Who should I marry? All the different things. But are we taking the time to look at others to be able to help encourage them and push them forward into their calling? That is what Jonathan did. He knew who he was. He gave up his position. And he encouraged David to move after what God had called him to be. If you guys have been a part of our church for any time, you probably heard my dad share a story about a similar story with him. He was running from the law and they were out trying, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but there was a time in his life when he was working at Sears, he was a mechanic. He goes to this service, holy roller service. Some guest speaker begins to prophesy over him. And my dad's thinking, I don't know this guy. He doesn't know me. This guy's wrong and God must be wrong. Started saying, you're going to be a pastor, all this kind of stuff. And he didn't know anybody at this service, this big church. And he went back, anointed, went back, mechanic. But there was someone in his life that saw what God saw and believed what was spoken over his life. And every time they ran into a pass, this guy's name is Jim Pearson. He's been here a couple times. Every time he would come across... He'd call him Pastor Frank. Even though he's still a mechanic, Pastor Frank. That was a Jonathan in my dad's life. Still, still a Jonathan in my dad's life. Are we being Jonathans? Because I know that many times we want to be the Davids, all this. But are we being Jonathans in people's life? Taking the time. You don't have to be a pastor. That's not like the ultimate thing. I want to make it clear of that, Okay. But seeing what God sees in people, are we taking the time to sit back, take the risk, be committed to see what God sees in people? To be able to encourage them in the Lord, encourage them in their faith in God. When you see someone struggling, being able to come up beside them, spend time with them, maybe even financial risk, whether it be emotional or whatever it might be, are we taking the time to encourage someone in the Lord? Great friendships include God. Jim was a true friend. My dad is a true friend. Jonathan was a true friend to David. Finally, great friendships reflect great love. Years go by again. Many years go by in this time frame and in their relationships. And one day Jonathan is killed out on a battlefield. The same day as Saul. Something that caused me really like just great interest. And I know I want to kind of dive into it a little bit deeper. 
is just being able to see the miraculous hand upon God, upon David's life. Because as David's, or as, as Saul's hatred for David grew, that's exactly when God provided Jonathan into his life to be there. But they died on the same day. Saul was no longer a threat to David any longer. And that's the same day that Jonathan died too. And this has nothing to do with my point. But I believe that there are seasons of true friends. That there may be something that you're going through. Someone is there to come alongside you and helps to get you through it and push you through it to where they maybe not live right next to you or they might be not as close as it was then, but there's still a connection. I have many of those friends down in San Diego where we may text every year or every couple of years or when we see someone having a new baby, just send them a quick text. But those were true friends in my life when I needed it the most down there, when I was struggling with certain things in my life. And you can have true friends in your life, whether it be a season or it can be a lifetime, like with my parents, like with, with Jim and my dad. But that God brings them. But great friendships reflect great love. And so Jonathan... Our, Jonathan dies and David mourns him for years. And then years go by. He becomes the king of Judah. Then he becomes the king over all of Israel. And one day he's sitting on the throne. He's sitting on the throne. And this is what he had to say in, in, in 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 11. It says, now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Makur, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Not to like change it but I just feel the need to speak like a Scottish accent right there. In Mekir, the son of Amiel, the lute. I, I don't know how to do it, but I'm sorry. This is where you're supposed to be like landing the plane, get all emotional. Sorry, I screwed it up. Verse five says, Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Mekir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had to come had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. Verse 11, again, he says, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. David was now on the king. And he had remembered that commitment that he made to Jonathan years earlier. Jonathan passes away and he was reminded of that commitment. And he wants to continue to extend that love, extend that commitment, extend that kindness. And he goes in search for a relative, anyone that he can bless. That we see a demonstration of great love. What needs to be understood is in this culture, in this day and age, usually what would take place is another person from outside the family would become king and one of their first things they would do is they would go and kill all the descendants of the last king to make sure that they wouldn't rise up and revolt and try and take over the throne back. So Mephibosheth is scared out of his wits. Use any descriptive word you want. He is scared. And he comes in and King David's like, Mephibosheth? And he's like, here I am at your service. Falls prostrate on the ground. And that's why David says, don't fear. I'm going to bless you. Because of the commitment I had to your dad, I'm going to bless you. That we see a demonstration of great love because of a great commitment and great sacrifice and great friendships taking place. That he wasn't just showing love. He was inviting him into his house. 
to eat as one of his sons, that he took him underneath his covering, that we see a full circle taking place because David was once that boy that came out of poverty and began to eat at the king's table. And now Mephibosheth was in hiding. Jonathan's sons thought he was going to be executed, and what happened? Came in to the table to be able to eat and be provided for, that we can see a great demonstration of love. And ultimately, what all this points to is Jesus. Jesus showed a great commitment to us. He showed great risk and sacrifice as he went to the cross. And he did it all because of a great love that he had for each and every one of us. And he brings us into the family of God and to be able to eat at the table prepared for us. If that was you this morning, I'm not gonna ask you to stand up, but I believe God is trying to get your attention, that he prepared that table for you. His goodness and his mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. But that is the goodness of God. But we can't go away and just think, oh, that's great, all this points to Jesus. No, we still need to make great friends. We still need to take part and cultivate and grow our friendships with other people that God has placed in our lives because those are the ones that are going to help push us into our destiny and calling, but also we're the ones that need to be the Jonathans as well. Don't overlook that fact that you need to be a Jonathan in someone else's life as well. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up. Proverbs eighteen twenty four says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And that is what God wants us to be to some other true friends that he is bringing into our lives, that he wants us to be that friend that sticks closer than a brother, but ultimately that is Jesus. And I hope and pray that if you are going through something that you would experience the love of Jesus, the love of the Father, in your life, that Holy Spirit would bring comfort in your life. Let me just pray as we close. And as we go from here, just allow Holy Spirit to minister to you and speak into your heart and into your life what he wants to show you this morning. But let me just close in prayer. And if you need prayer for anything, I just want to be able to invite you forward. We're not going to have music right now, but we'll be able to have some goodies. But if you need prayer for anything, we also want to be able to to take time to pray with you. But let me just close. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness, for your love, for your mercy. We thank you for your scripture and your word that it encourage us in a time of need, but also encourage us, us to move forward into our calling and destiny, God. And I just pray for us that are in a stage of transition and vulnerability, that you would bring the right person into our lives and that we would be able to see them, and that we would be able to be committed, that we would be honest, that we would be able to take a great risk, even when other things are going on, even if, just like with Jonathan and Saul, that he took a great risk, that even if family, there's an issue with family, but that we would take a great risk, God, even, and include you, that we would include you in our friendships, in our relationships, God, and that we would be able to demonstrate a great love, the love of Father. Be able to have your love, that agape love, that sees others as you see them. Not as we see them, not in our flesh, but a spiritual connection would take.